ideal proposal. But how do I go about in doing this? So her friend says, let me handle this. I got this. So she goes to the Prophet wasallam and she says, have you considered Khadija? And she says that she comes from a very, very noble family. She is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with numerous blessings in her life. Would you consider a proposal from Khadija? And the Prophet ﷺ says, of course. What better proposal could there be? Someone like Khadija. The nobility of Khadija, the character of Khadija, the integrity of Khadija. So the Prophet ﷺ says, I need to go and talk to my uncle about this. I need to go and consult with him. And he says to him, oh uncle, I am interested in Khadija. So his uncle knew that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had chosen the right woman for him. And therefore, they went ahead and asked the uncle of Khadija at that time to be present and seek and propose to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. At that moment, Abu Talib in the presence of his family and the family of Khadija stood up and gave his beautiful sermon that this is my nephew Muhammad, no man is equal to him. No man is equal to his manners, no man is equal to his morals, no man is equal to his discipline, no man is equal to his honesty, and no man is equal to his trustworthiness. So the uncle of Khadija got up and he said, oh Abu Talib, everything you said about Muhammad is correct. And Abu Talib mentioned that here we are, the children of Abdul Muttalib, the family of Bani Hashim, a respectful, noble family, where he to seek and ask for the hand of Khadija, who is also from a noble, respectful family like you. So the uncle of Khadija, he said, then let everyone witness that I had accepted the marriage of Muhammad to my niece Khadija. Some of the narrations mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ, however, doesn't hesitate in regards to the proposal, but says, you know, I need a little bit of time to kind of get some things ready for marriage, a marriage gift to my wife, Mahar. And Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha says, none of that is necessary. What we're looking for is happiness, to share a life together. And the Prophet ﷺ presents the mahar of 20 camels. It's not extravagant, but at the same time, he's not cheapening out over here either. And they get together and then they basically have a feast where the official marriage proposal, the ijab in the qubul, right, where he proposes and she accepts the proposal. So now they basically get married and they settle down with a the family, they start a family together. I mean, we talk about Zainab and Umm Kulthum and Ruqayya and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhunna. Talk about these noble, illustrious women. So he spent time with his kids. He sat with his kids. He played with his kids. He fed his kids, tucked them in at night, talked to them, spoke to them, played with them. That's what the Prophet ﷺ invested a decade of his life into. They had six children during this time. The first of their children was a boy by the name of Al-Qasim. Again, very tragically, Qasim reached the age of a year and basically passed away before his second birthday. Secondly, they had a daughter by the name of Zainab who grew up and lived a full life. She got married, she had children, etc. Their third child, second daughter, was by the name of Umm Kulthum who would later on be married to the famous Khalifa companion of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, by the name of Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. The third daughter and fourth child that they had was a girl by the name of Ruqayya, the name of Ruqayya. And after Umm Kulthum would pass away very tragically, very young, Ruqayya would marry later on to Uthman ibn Affan. And then their fifth child, their fourth daughter, was a girl by the name of Fatima, who again was the only child of the Prophet ﷺ who outlived him. And she passed away six months after he passed away. She would have two sons by the name of Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and they would be just the heart and soul of the Prophet ﷺ. And then finally his sixth child, which was his second son, was by the name of Abdullah. And he also passed away very, very young. Some narrations even mentioned he passed away while still an infant. These were the six children that him and Khadija had together. This couple has grown together deeply in love. 
They never argued. They never fought. They never had any difficulty or adversity with one another. It was peace and happiness, love and affection, kindness and mercy and forgiveness. And when he reached the age of 38, 39, he started to see dreams at night. And what would happen is the next day, the dream would come true. And once that started to happen, then he really started to reflect. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ decided, I need to kind of get some time away. I need some time to reflect. And that's when he tells his wife, and he's been telling her, I have these dreams, and whatever I see comes true the next day. And she tells him, don't worry, just trust your heart. Everything has a purpose and a reason. How long do you need to go for? At least a couple of days. I'm going to go find a nice spot in the mountains, not too far away. But I need a secluded, nice spot where I can go and I can reflect. She packs him together some food, some supplies, some clothes, and sends him off very lovingly. And the Prophet ﷺ goes outside of Mecca, finds a mountain by the name of Nur, Jabal Nur. And there he finds a small cave by the name of Hira, Ghar Hira. And he actually chose that spot because when he sat at the mouth of the cave, he could see the Kaaba from there. And he sits down and he begins to meditate and reflect and pray and think over here. And he would be gone for a few days at a time and he would come back down and go back home, spend a few weeks at home, a month or so at home, then pack up some stuff and then go again. One time it mentions that he was gone and Khadija helped him pack the stuff that he was taking. So she knew exactly how much food he had. She realizes that he's been gone longer than what he had food for. So she packs some food and some supplies together and she actually goes outside of Mecca and climbs up the mountain and the Prophet is sitting at the opening of the cave and he sees her and says, what are you doing here? And she says, I got worried about you. I want to make sure that you were okay. I brought some food for you. So this is what their relationship was like, one of understanding and facilitating and providing and accommodating one another. So we know of that blessed day when the Prophet ﷺ receives divine revelation. And then when the Prophet ﷺ comes down from Al-Hira, and he comes to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, with the famous words of Zammiluni, embrace me, cover me up, seeking comfort in Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she didn't say to the Prophet ﷺ, you know, maybe you shouldn't be going out there so long. Maybe you should stay home more often. Maybe you shouldn't have been out there in the first place. She didn't say to the Prophet ﷺ, you know, I think you're getting a little crazy on us. She didn't say to the Prophet Wasallam, I think that it must be some demons or something like that. Rather, she would reassure the Prophet Wasallam. She supported him emotionally and religiously here. Think about this. She says to the Prophet Wasallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never disgrace you because you uphold the ties of kinship. You're good to your neighbor. You treat the orphans well. You take up the cause of the one who has been wronged. In essence, what is she saying to the Prophet ﷺ? She's 